Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. 1 Kings chapter 20, beginning in verse 22. Remember, you can study all of the Bible with me anytime you want to, as much as you want to, using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. And the prophet came to the king of Israel and said unto him, Go, strengthen thyself, and mark, and see what thou doest. For at the return of the year, the king of Syria will come up against thee. Now, Syria attacked Israel, and with the help of God, Israel repelled Syria, even though they were much tougher. But now here, God warns the king of Israel that they need to prepare because Syria is going to come back. They beat Syria by God's power this last time. Now God says that they have to prepare because Syria is not going to give up. And part of the way God blesses his people is to give them time to prepare for what needs to be done and also giving them the ability to prepare. 23. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Just silliness. The foolish, darkened soul of the lost and those who are given over to their sin of idolatry and anything and everything except God, that foolishness goes right to their mind and affects how they think. And you see it here. The Syrians figured that they lost the last war because they fought in the hills. They think that if they can fight the next time in the fields, they will win because... After all, Israel's God is just the God of the hills. He's not the God of the plains. What kind of goofy thinking is that? They have no idea what they're talking about. Of course, they also had chariots, so they thought that probably would give them an advantage in the fields, and they would have been useless in the hills. But the main thing is they, they don't think God is almighty. They think God is limited by the strengths and weaknesses of his people. The Israelites don't have chariots like the Syrians do. Therefore, God can't help them. Well, we'll see. 24, and do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their places. The king, the king of Syria replaces the 32 other kings who fought with him last time, with fighting men. See, he's doing everything he possibly can to avoid losing again. 25. And number thee an army, like the army that thou hast lost, horse for horse, chariot for chariot, and we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And they hearkened unto their voice and did so. The king had been humiliated by the little army of Israel. So he's anxious to prove that Syria and the confederation of 32 other nations that she has put together are tougher and they will beat Israel. They're going to do it this time. He's determined. 26. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek, to fight against Israel. So the king of Syria has been planning this war for months. Very meticulously, he has been planning his strategy for defeating Israel. If Israel, is, if Israel loses, it's certainly not going to be God's fault, as the king of Syria thinks, because God warned Israel to prepare. 
and gave them plenty of time to do it, months to prepare for this war, just as the Syrians had been doing. God expects us to use our brain and the things that he has given us to prepare, to prepare ourselves. 27, and the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of kids, but the Syrians filled the country. So a real mismatch again, humanly speaking. The army of Israel did what they could to prepare in obedience to God. I'll give them credit. But in the natural, they didn't stand a chance against this huge enemy that they are facing off against. 28, and there came a man of God and spoke unto the king of Israel and said, thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, the Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore, will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Good old God is so good to the rebellious nation of Israel and their ungodly king and queen, Ahab and Jezebel. He's showing, he's showing the king who God really is, trying to pull him back to the Lord and to the worship of the one true God. He's, I'm going to defeat Syria for you. Against all odds, I'm going to defeat Syria for you to show you that I'm God. Maybe you'll quit worshiping all your idols. God is going to give puny Israel victory over mighty Syria to prove to both of them, Syria and Israel, that he is God. It's not for any goodness in Israel that they will win. It's going to be for God's honor, period. That's it. 29. And they encamped opposite one another seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day, the battle was joined and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians and hundred thousand footmen in one day. And that's without a nuclear bomb. A hundred thousand men killed in Syria. hundred thousand in one day. Took, what, 10 years for America to lose 50,000 in Vietnam. A hundred thousand in one day? Well, Syria got beat, and we know why. It's because they insulted God, saying that he was the God of the hills, but not of the fields. Well, God showed them. Unorthodox, unscriptural religious beliefs affect the way we think and the way we live and how we determine what we're going to do. And the, the closer a nation is to a biblical society, and the, for that matter, the closer that a person is to a biblical life, the more blessed that person or that nation will be, 30. But the rest fled to Aphek, into the city, and there a wall fell upon 20 and 7,000 of the men who were left. And Ben-Hadad fled, and came into the city, into an inner chamber. Aphek was a fortress that the scared Syrians ran to, but it didn't do them any good. Their real enemy was God, not Israel. And since God was in that fortress before they even arrived, once they did arrive, he simply caused the wall to fall on them, 27,000 more dead, just like that. Can't outrun God, can't defeat God. Verse 31, and his servants said unto him, behold, now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray thee, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes upon our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Perhaps he will save thy life. At least there was some mercy in Ahab, especially compared to the heathen kings outside of Israel. 32. So they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel, and said, Thy servant Ben-Hadad saith, I pray thee, let me live. And he said, Is he yet alive? He is my brother. These Syrians who are 
begging to be spared are the same bunch that had bragged about whipping Israel, no problem. They are the same bunch that said God was the God of the hills, not the gods of the valleys or the plains. They are the same ones who insulted Almighty God, the God that gave Ahab the victory to prove that he was God. It's the same bunch. And what about Ahab calling the king of Syria his brother? What in the world is that? 33. Now, the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, Thy brother, Benadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Benadad came forth to him and caused him to come up into the chariots. The king of Syria is the same guy who would have taken Ahab's wives, remember? and his wealth, and his children, and anything else that he liked in the nation Israel, if he would have won that war, because that's what he said he would do. I'm taking everything that I want. And Ahab calls him my brother. What a fool. 34, and Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So Ahab treated Benadad much better than Benadad would have treated Ahab if he had won this war. 35, and a certain man of the sons of the prophets said unto his neighbor, in the word of the Lord, smite me, I pray thee. And the man refused to smite him. So one of those prophets who had been hiding asked his fellow prophet to hit him, but the man would not do it. 36, then said he unto him, because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him for disobeying God and not hitting the prophet. The man who refused to hit the prophet at the word of the Lord was disobeying God. The prophet may have been his friend, but God commanded him to hit him. But he disobeyed. He wouldn't do it. He may have disobeyed for sentimental reasons, but it's still disobedience to God. And as a result, he died as punishment. God plays hardball. <clears throat> Good to remember that. Verse 37. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray thee. And the man smote him so that in smiting he wounded him. You know, sometimes God may ask his people to do things that seem strange. Strange, like go around and ask people to hit you. God is using this to make a point, and the prophet is suffering in order to be used by God. We're going to see what that point is in just a second. Verse 38, so the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, talking about King Ahab, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. The king of Israel might think the prophet is one of his soldiers who was injured in the recent war. So look at 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, the guy disguised, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man, if by any means he be missing then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. So a soldier in battle has to obey his commander. This prophet is pretending to be a soldier who did not obey. He wants to see what King Ahab's going to do about it. It's all part of God's plan. 40. And as thy servant was busy here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall thy judgment be, thy thyself have decided it. In other words, Ahab said, Your own mouth spoke your punishment. You're gonna be you're gonna be dead. You're gonna die for failing to obey your commander, just like you know you would have been, or just like you knew was going to happen. Forty one. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel recognized him that he was one of the prophets. And Ahab probably knew 
there was more to this than what it appeared to be. Notice 42. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. Ahab no, he had no right, Ahab had no right, to cozy up to the wicked king of Syria, one that God despised, a horrible sinner that God despised. He had no right to cozy up to that king. The king it would have been different if the king of Syria would have repented of his sins and acknowledged God Almighty as the one true God. But he didn't repent of anything, including his blasphemy of Almighty God. God let Israel, God let Israel win to punish the king of Assyria, but Ahab did not punish him. Instead, Ahab called this wicked king his brother. He took sides with a blasphemer. If Ahab would have been a servant of God, then he would have, he would have taken sides with God. He would have been angry at Syria's blasphemy. 43. And the king of Israel went to his house resentful and displeased and came to Samaria. Well, there's a stubborn, rebellious sinner for you right here. Instead of repenting of his sin after having judgment pronounced upon him, he could have probably at least saved his soul if he had repented. He wouldn't have saved his life because judgment had been pronounced. But he, he, was, he was given that death sentence, as it were, to wake him up to the fact that he needed to repent. So at least his soul would be saved after he was dead. But instead, he gets angry with God because he's going to be punished for his sin. Stubborn, rebellious sinner. People like this go to hell. We'll stop right there. Study all of the Bible with me verse by verse using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four series going through the whole Bible verse by verse. To be a part of this ministry, pray for me and God's Word. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That's how you can be a part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.